Merry Birthmas. And how dare you remind me how much time has passed. So in this video, I'm more interested in what happened before the iPod, because honestly, that's where all the nuggets live. <laughs> the Comotron. We know that this was a huge hit, right? Spawn the mono, the, the souffle. No, no. Probably my favorite little fact. Oh, they don't fit. Look, it's the, the support. No, no. Oh. Quick, Chiflet, get in there. Yeah! Mini can help out too. <laughs> Guys, come on, we can still see you. What kind of backstage crew are you? Get, get out of it. My favorite little tidbit, this guy and this guy are only six years apart. Six years! All right, clear out, you. Oh, what an embarrassing effort from you two. Come with me. So, yeah, the iPod, yeah? Humongous success. Well, eventually. <laughs> Context is everything, and it's actually amazing how dangerous of a move this product was. A lot of people forget that in the 90s, Apple nearly went bankrupt. Get some 90s Macs on screen. Ooh, can you believe people didn't want these? Steve Jobs had just come back, basically cancelled everything that they were working on. They were just like, stop it. <laughs> no one wants these. The iMac had come out, and Apple was wet from the gutters. They were out of the gutters, but they were soaking wet. Like, to team up with Apple at the time, I mean, yeah, today that'd be a no-brainer, but back then it was like, uh, you guys are kind of wet from the gutters, huh? The inventor of the iPod, Tony Fidel. Tony had already been working on an MP3 player with his own company. No one was buying MP3 players yet. It was so early. Tony just wanted to work with Apple as like a consulting gig. He showed Steve Jobs his designs. He saw this one and Steve Leach just grabbed it and said, this is what we're making and you're going to help us make it. The craziest detail, right, is it was to be released Christmas 2001. They only really got started in May. 2001. That's nuts. And I love it from all the other articles coming out. We can see a development iPod. Look at this big beige. I mean, that's King Nugget. When it launched, it sold like 125,000 units till like the end of the year. Pretty low key sales, really. And Tony approached Steve and said, Are you guys going to stick with this? Because he'd had the run with other companies where they'd release a product and then just can it and move on and he'd have to start all over again. And Steve was like, Yeah, we're doubling down. And I think it was something like 16 to 18 iterations of the iPod he had his hand in. Wow, what amazing career. It's really easy to take for granted these controls and the way it works, because I'm going to show you... <laughs> I'm gonna show you some guys that came before this. The guys that inspired this. So for the uninitiated, like this is a five gigabyte device. And I'm gonna tell you how stinking humongous that was. Look, it's a Samsung. Yup. This is from the year 2000. This is a year before the iPod. This was Samsung's go at it. 32 megabytes. <laughs> 32 megabytes. No screen, no nothing. You have to use the remote to see what you're doing. But look out, big capacity. The, the, the Comotron. <laughs> Why is it called that? Why does it look like this? What's this distended part here? Flash storage is stinking expensive. It still is, but now a couple of hundred bucks will get you a couple of terabytes. This really was as much as you could put in there that was feasible to sell. So having a hard drive was just the only option at the time. But Apple didn't invent the hard drive MP3 player either. They were called jukeboxes. <laughs> yeah, you know it's 90s because it's got its dad case on. So the thing about hard drive music plays is that batteries have sucked for the longest time. It was when lithium ion was finally like accessible and like easy to put into things that like pocketable devices were really worth it. And so to have a PC hard drive spinning away in there, you're gonna chew that battery in like 15 minutes. <laughs> and so the, the way that they make them work is they use the RAM as a cache. So basically the RAM could hold maybe two or three songs, because the thing that takes longest is to spin the hard drive up. It'll load three songs and play those. And that's how these survive drops, by the way, because more likely the drive wasn't spinning. But Apple didn't invent that. This is from 98, 97. Invented by Compaq. I'm telling you, I can't believe I have one of these. I can't get it to turn on, but it is absolute rarity. Oh, it's correct. This is the very first ever hard drive jukebox. It was super nugget. You couldn't browse music. As soon as you checked another song, it would start playing it. You couldn't use it as storage. You couldn't plug it into the computer and put your homework on it. Nope, wouldn't do it. Yep, the PJB100. Reviews from back in the day basically just go, 
this is the future. This is how to do it. Don't forget, the high rollers at the time were rolling CD players. You could make an MP3 CD at some point and get heaps of music on there, but nowhere near this guy. Double kick it, this is from 03, when they got them so slim that they're basically just the circumference of a CD. And even still, it is a chonk monster. So now you're going, oh, well, so Apple didn't invent the MP3 player, and like, they didn't invent the hard drive player. Oh, but they were the first ones to make it popular, though, to get it in the hands of people. Uh, pfft. No. <laughs> no. Nope. Oh my duck. The creative nomad jukebox. This was the darling of the year 2000 of like, if you want a jukebox, you go and get one of these. Apple actually pointed at this nugget in their keynote for the iPod and said, that's who we're going against. This technically inspired the iPod. Outputs galore, like two line outs and a line in, full size chonk USB, that's always fun. Just controls everywhere. I'm guessing they just put like water on their fingers and flicked at it and wherever the water landed, that's where they put the buttons. And it's got a five gigabyte drive in it. I believe it's one they were using in laptops at the time. These first iPods are super chunk, hey? I mean, look at the size of this boy. But then I go, ba ba do ba do do. <laughs> this is why this guy was so popular. It has a bigger screen, better controls. It only uses one cable to charge and sync. It's why Apple went with Firewire. It was the only one that could do it. Like USB 1.0 was molasses slow and just couldn't charge devices yet. USB had to grow into its shoes. It was not a slam dunk winner out the gates. Although that said, when the iPod launched, a lot of the hardcore still said, no, well, I prefer this. These do sound really good. And I think this is full of like Avishai Cohen or something. But there's more to the story. <laughs> yeah, it takes <laughs> brand new boys. Yes, today as a collector, this is way better because you can just quickly throw some batteries in it, play with your nugget, and then like take them out and put it away. But at the time, this sucked. In 2003, I got my first MP3 player. It was some little 128 megabyte Dick Smith guy. And I vividly remember standing in the supermarket, looking at the price of the batteries going, oh my gosh, I'm buying these today. And also the pain of listening to music, wandering off, coming back four hours later to find it still playing and going, ah! <laughs> <laughs> it, was, it was the equivalent of like leaving your car running all night and your full tank of fuel's gone. Like, that's how it felt as a kid. Uh-oh. Oi. Oi. Oh, guys. It was working last week. I was like, good, it works, we're ready. Oh. <laughs> You're not missing out on anything. You can see a tortured UI and these crappy could Give me back my boys. Stupid garbage. This was pulling 10 hours battery back then out of its lithium ion recharge. We'll just plug it in and off you go. This thing chews through those double A's. It wants to be plugged into a wall, but you can see it's got like a remote input there. It was something that was trying to be a little bit portable, but also like a hi-fi setup if you wanted, which is cool. Although one bad side was this was Mac only. It wasn't until the Windows version of iTunes came out that iPods really started selling. And it's basically why those freakish HP iPods existed, which was to shake the stigma that it was Mac only anymore. But I mean, you look at the early ads, it's the fact that you can put five gigs of music in your pocket. And it's all thanks to the micro little drives they have in these. And that's Toshiba. Toshiba came up with those. And the whole design was based around it. Yes, you had to use iTunes to use this, but just about every player tended to have their own software or music match or something. And the practice of being able to put music on, but then not take it off. Well, this guy did that too. And uh, you can thank record labels for that because they own the music, even if the artists don't care if people are downloading it. And it wasn't just these two. I mean, these were the main ones that people see and look at. Everyone was having a go. I mean, the competition was nuts. Look at this Conan looking idiot. This is before the iPod 2, the Arcos 6000 jukebox. Six gigs, ooh! It looks like this because I'm not sure. This is sealed new, I found this for like 50 bucks. Oh, we'll smell this one day. Or how about the Hit Zip? A spin-off of zip drives. There was a really unreliable little pockety ones. Go check out LGR, he's done a thing about these. Eventually, Dell even had a go. This is my favorite ever, right? Because it's some sort of iPod mini competition or something. It's brand new, no one bought this. But my favorite detail is someone's written iPod on the side of it. <laughs> 
I mean, that's how popular the iPod got, is that no one called them MP3 players. They were just called iPods. Oh, poor Dell. <laughs> That's maximum shame. But wow, the risks Apple took, the risks everyone took. Each division at Apple's a really, really tight team making these things individually and specifically. And it's funny how this led to the iPhone. It really did. It was in 05 that they started working on a phone. And for the longest time, it had a click wheel on it. I'm being serious. They really were seriously considering it. But I love that these fugly nuggets is basically the birth of the SSD, the modern SSD that we find in everything. This is its ground zero. <laughs> for crap like this. Yes, the writing's on the wall for the iPod. You know, the iPod Touch is just a footnote now, even though it does run iOS 15, which is super fun. It's okay if some brands just take a bit of a breather. It doesn't mean the iPod's gone forever. Just for now, hey, perfect example. Dodge Challenger, absolute hero car from the 70s, right? Well, they stopped making them in 83 and didn't start again until 2008. And now they're a mainstay again. Now it's just like, oh yeah, classic Dodge Challenger. iPod just needs to take a break. It helped birth the modern smartphone, push the music industry into directions it never foresaw, encouraged prolific downloading on the internet. Come on, that deserves a sit down, doesn't it? But it really has shaped the world as we know it. Love or hate Apple, what a beautiful nugget they made. Well, that's it. Thanks so much for watching. Huge thanks to my patrons, especially these stinky names right here, mate, because one dollar a month, I do extra videos. Nearly no intro. We're doing the Comatron. <laughs> I've, been, I've wanted to open this so bad, and I've never had an excuse to. Like, how does this tie into anything at all? Unless we're talking about the vintage nuggets that shaped our world. So, yeah, we're going to take a smell of the Comatron and probably realize that it's so old that I have nothing that can sync with it. And so, like, I'll, I'll see you all next time. When you turn out the lights, Frank gets brave. Look, it's brave, Frank. Being very brave. Frank, are you bravely licking your floor in the dark? Well, I've learned that Frank likes to lick the floor in the dark now. <laughs> oh no, she's all done.